Thank you very much indeed, Ray, and uh, thank you to New MR for uh, this opportunity to chat about the yin and yang of big data. Uh, it's, this is something that has um, uh, become, if you like, one of the de rigueur uh, conversations of the research and the marketing industries to such an extent that it's almost deafening. Um, so I want to take you through uh, the progression of that conversation uh, based on a series of studies that we at Cambia have now been doing for about five years called the Future of Research series. And this is an annual study of change in primarily the North American market, although it has now extended to Latin America, and we hope it will extend to Europe and APAC uh, before too long but essentially looking at how people view the progression of research, how they view the future of research, what's happening now to make that future happen. We talk to CMOs, we talk to VPs of Insights, we talk to the leadership of research companies, both established and new, uh, as well as leadership of adjacent industries such as technology, and sample. Uh, this year we also talked uh, to very new entrants into the industry and to young researchers as well to see what their um, perspective was. And this year was a deep dive qualitative study and um, regrettably uh, if we were live I would have lots of wonderful video and uh, you'd see a lot of uh, luminaries from the industry talking about what big data means to them but since GoToWebinar is not that reliable with video, um, you're going to have to rely on me uh, tech, giving you text quotes and reading them out, so my apologies in advance. Um, so before I go on, uh, Ray uh, thanked his sponsors. I must thank mine. Um, we were very lucky this year to have two excellent partners, the Seek Company out of Cincinnati and the Corporate Executive Board who've been our partners for about four years now. So thank you very much to them. Now I guess it's become a, a bit of a truism uh, that technology um, is driving change in market research. Uh, certainly the changes that have occurred due to technology in our lives have been profound over the last decade. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we have been through not just technological change, but really cultural change as well. Uh, the whole cultural change brought about by the mobile device and what you can do with it and social media and how you connect with it has brought us to a state of interconnectedness that is truly remarkable and un, un, unheard of. And as that has been progressing, obviously so research has been taking advantage of that and has been changed in itself. And it's really somewhat uh, sobering to think that Communispace, which recently sold for about $100 million to Omnicom, didn't exist just over a decade ago. Uh, neither did SurveyMonkey, a company that's now worth around $1.2 or $1.3 billion. Uh, we didn't have things like neuroscience. We didn't have things like crowdsourcing, or at least we, did, we knew about crowdsourcing, but we didn't know how to, how to activate it. Um, the mobile device itself, all that we could do with that, that has, has changed the way in which we think about research in many ways. And now here we are as consumers pouring off masses of data uh, from all the devices that we use, including our credit and debit cards in stores, and producing what is now being referred to as big data. As we go into the future, uh, I'm hearing more and more now from uh, uh, some of the more enlightened minds at the edges of the industry that they believe wearables is just, uh, as, a, as a technology, 
so Google Glass and other wearables uh, are going to bring about the next big revolution. So what does this all mean for us as researchers? What does it mean for the craft and the profession and the industry of research? What are people saying about this? Well, to some degree, there is ambivalence in this conversation. For some, the whole advent of big data is a candy store of unimaginable proportions that they've just been allowed to run amok in. They see this whole data revolution as their license to be able to do things that were unimaginable before, come to insights that were unattainable before, and have an impact that they haven't had before. Others, on the other hand, see this as a potential gross intrusion into privacy, as Big Brother, uh, and even if not creepy, as potentially something to be worried about from a regulatory point of view. So there is an ambivalence and a dichotomy in the conversation, uh, and it is, uh, if you like, a real conversation in that respect. Certainly we know that CMOs are obsessed with the idea of big data and what it can do and what it should do. They're also obsessed by uh, a concern that perhaps their own positions and their own jobs are, are seeing a migration of power towards the CIO, the holder of all the information. But whether they're concerned or obsessed, they're certainly very active in, in looking for knowledge about big data. One of the most curious statistics of 2012 was that at the Consumer Electronics Show, not a place that you would normally expect to see chief marketing officers. There were over 350 CMOs in attendance. So when we talk to CMOs and we ask them, you know, what is it that keeps you up at night? What are you most concerned about? What do you think about most? Almost invariably, the words big data trips trip off their lips. We can look at this from another perspective. We can look at it from the perspective of the investor, some, the people who are putting their money where their mouths are. And Cambia runs a, what we call a capital funding index every year, where we measure all the new capital coming into our industry, the marketing research and analytics industry, and look where it's going. One of the things we've seen is an explosion of investment in this arena. This is a very hot arena for investors right now, almost tripling in three years. But where is that money going? Well, it's not going into traditional market research. Yes, there's some, but not a huge amount. Where it's going is into anything that calls itself analytics. Seriously, if you have a business plan and you want to get funding, make sure you have the words analytics in that plan. But what type of analytics? Well, invariably, in 2013, we were seeing big data analytics. Now, we have to be a little bit careful about this because this is self-description. So we take all of this information from the announcements of uh, investments being made, in, and these are public announcements, and we look at how they describe themselves, how the companies describe themselves. So this is maybe a little bit of hype, but nonetheless, it seems that investors are betting big time that big data uh, is going to be a, ro a road to fortune for them in the future. And we know, obviously, that investors are herd animals, just like we are, um, but nonetheless, it is an indicator of just how dominant uh, this particular topic of conversation has become. So let's just go back a little and ask the question, what is big data? How do people define it? 
uh, big data? Do they know what big data is or are? Frankly, the answer is no. When you talk to 10 different people, you'll get 11 different answers. But as somebody once said to me, that's not that unusual in an emerging technology. If you would talked in the mid-90s to people about what the internet was, you'd have probably got 10 different answers. And probably those answers wouldn't actually reflect what the internet is today. Change is that fast. However, there are some interesting uh, perspectives and quotes here. I love the, the top quote, big data is essential. By the way, what is big data? That came from a client. Um, on the agency side, I will not reveal his identity, but I love the quote, big data is synthetic development of intuition. If anybody has any idea what that means, please let me know. But nonetheless, what we have here are um, thoughts ranging from what it is in terms of large amounts of unstructured data all the way through to saying it's just a buzzword. It has no uh, real meaning or real effect. Uh, here are two quotes that I would like to read out to you. You would have seen a video, uh, but it, they do uh, illustrate very well this sense of perhaps confusion or um, disagreement. The first is from a very senior executive at a large market research company, and he's got a very specific idea of what big data is. There's data that exists in the world through technology and that give insight into our lives. What we care about, what we search for, what websites we go to, how we use our phones, who we are texting, many, many different things. If you know how to read it and you can access it, and you can process it, then we gain very, very unique insights into consumers, into people. I think that's an interesting quote for many reasons. He defines the sources of the data, and of course there are many other sources as well that go into big data streams. But he also puts a few contingencies on it. If you know how to read it, if you know how to access it, if you can process it, and as we'll see a little later on in this lecture, it's not at all clear that those contingencies are currently being adequately met. But what I thought was fascinating as well was there was a very senior executive we talked to from a large database company, a mixed database and research company, and he was very clear. To me, big data is a marketing term. Databases have been around for decades. Big data is just saying they're getting bigger. And this was from a firm that really invented big data in a particular industry and have taken it as, as very much their own. And yet here they were saying, you know, it's not that big a thing. It's just a marketing term. It's just saying that, that the databases are getting bigger. What is clear as we talk to a lot of uh, these industry leaders is that the whole existence of big data and the conversation around big data has led to some interesting conundrums. The first of these is that there is an awareness that all this data is out there, but there is not a great understanding of how best to use it. There is not an understanding necessarily of where it produces a return on investment, and what role it can actually play in the organization. There's not really a, a clear idea as to how to harness the data, especially when it lies in various different silos, and how to bring that together uh, and mine it for, for insights. This extends all the way from disagreement about do you just mine the data and see what it produces, or do you ask it specific questions and set up specific frameworks for it to be able to provide answers? People don't know yet. We're at the beginning of uh, honing the craft, if you like. The second conundrum is a real vagueness, and more than a vagueness, a concern 
and a worry about where big data fits into the organization and more importantly who controls it who's in charge of it and who has the budget it's not clear that there is any particular trend within organizations to a one solution or another so in some organizations for example uh, there is a specific big data analytics group that is separate from the market research or consumer insights function and that is quite frankly viewed by many in the market research uh, uh, function as a potential threat uh, there are other organizations where market research has taken the initiative and proactively become the steward if you like of big data maybe not the technological steward but the insights steward and who are, are integrating big data into the way in which they do research so they're integrating it into uh, survey research qualitative research all the so sorts of stuff that we have done in the past social media work and have successfully uh, become the the the, the founds of, of insights from big data as I say there is no real uh, trend that we can point to at the moment as to what model and there are probably others will uh, will prevail but there is a, a concern that if research if the consumer insights function does not proactively um, become that steward of big data then consumer insights might start to lose influence and power within the organization the third conundrum is very much around cost how much is this going to cost to implement where's the budget going to come from um, and how on earth do we measure the return on investment and the degree to which this is a conversation that is at the beginnings um, uh, at its beginning rather than being toward anywhere towards resolution there are very few answers that people are able to give to these self-imposed questions the cost is not, is something that people cannot yet really get their heads around what is clear is that if the market research function embraces big data or as it does so then it will need to overcome some hurdles that uh, people will point out to you first of all and this is you know, something that you would expect researchers to say and rightly so you know, there's a lot of data out there but is it the right data how do we know that it's the right data where you know, where is it sourced um, what's being measured who is being measured and how relevant is this to the business the business issue or the business problem and I think one of the key concerns that many researchers have is that yes we have all sorts of data uh, coming at us but um, it's only by application of good research practice and principle that we will be able to sort good data from bad I think one of the big examples in social media of this is uh, when people rely on Twitter and uh, analytics uh, mind not being mindful that the population that uses Twitter is very very different from the population at large this is the sort of question that we're getting thrown at us by professionals both on the client side and on the supply side even uh, as important there is a feeling that the tools that are needed to actually mine these large masses of, of data some of which run into terabytes aren't still not really there the technologies aren't really there now some will tell you that that's not the case uh, that yes the, the, the technology is there uh, others will say well it's not in our organization we don't have that technology and it's not just about tools either it's about skill sets as well and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go forward but there, there are tools and skill sets needed to both to analyze the data but also to synthesize uh, synthesize
synthesize from different data sets, different data sources, uh, and from, indeed, different insight streams. And there is uh, not a lot of confidence right now uh, anywhere within the industry that we have particularly those synthesis tools to hand. One of the things that I've uh, loved that came out of a lot of the interviews was that, yes, we, we are going to need a lot of data scientists. We're going to need the data sciences skills and tool sets. But, you know, data scientists, data scientists are great at analysis, but they really can't tell stories. And this is something, again, that uh, we uh, see in organizations, large and small, how can we actually tell the story of what big data is telling us? Because those who are actually mining the data are not necessarily going to have the skills to do so. And finally, in, in terms of hurdles, um, there is a, a, a major concern around privacy. Now, we've known about privacy concerns in the European markets for a long time. The EU has been particularly stringent in enforcing consumer rights, as it sees them, uh, in terms of protecting privacy. In the United States market, that has been less of a concern. Uh, and there's been more of a Wild West approach, if you like, to the development of these technologies and capabilities. But there is increasing realization now that that era is coming to an end. And that politicians, in particular, are beginning to see votes in privacy. And you only have to have one or two disasters like the Target disaster, where uh, at least 70 million of their customers had their private data compromised. And you can see that the politicians uh, will indeed be paying attention. Uh, and if not the politicians, the regulatory authorities. So the concerns for privacy range all the way from, from a genuine concern about breach of privacy or, or overreaching on privacy to a concern that we may find ourselves being regulated uh, in an industry which has fought against regulation um, for a very, very long time. Finally, the uh, industry needs to become a whole load better in terms of enabling people to understand what big data are showing them, what insights are coming out of big data. And in doing so, utilize data visualization tools that we have not really been familiar with very much in the past. Uh, and I think this is an area where uh, both clients and suppliers recognize that there is a lot of learning to do, uh, and that until that learning has occurred and until the data visualization technologies have advanced sufficiently, um, then uh, there is going to be a break on the widespread application of big data insights. So that is an area that people point out as, as needing uh, urgent development. So this is the conversation. Is it the holy grail? Is this a, a new era, a new dawn that we're going into, where the data that we are producing in uh, ever accelerating amounts um, is, is going to be the be and end all of the way in which we run businesses and do marketing? Uh, does it paint the complete picture? Um, and is it, is it enough? Uh, there are some who will tell you that, indeed, the answer is yes to all of those three questions. Uh, a few months ago, I interviewed the data editor of a very famous magazine uh, who told me that the era of social scientists was dead and that causation was dead and the correlation was king. Um, clearly, I uh, did not agree with him. And it's also very clear that 
those that we spoke to, both in corporations and in research companies and in ancillary companies, also agree that correlation is not king. Correlation is not enough. Correlation can lead you to extraordinarily bad insights uh, based on random noise, and that it can never replace, if not causation, an understanding of why things happen. And this is where we come to the yang, to the yin of big data. Because underneath the conversation that's roiling about big data itself is another conversation entirely, and it's almost as intense, and it's definitely as widespread. And this is a conversation about empathy. It's interesting that we've been talking now for a couple of years about how to measure emotion, how to measure consumer emotion, uh, and its relevance to things like product testing and packaging testing, copy testing, even customer experience work. How do we get to, customer, to, to consumer emotion? But as we have been getting there, and as new methodologies and new technologies have come forward to try and enable us to measure emotion, increasingly the conversation into, OK, so we have this understanding of emotion, but what do we do with it? How do we leverage it? And the answer that people are coming up with lies in the word empathy. So what do people mean when they talk about empathy? Clearly, they, they're talking, as in some of these quotes here, about a, a more intimate connection with their customers, the need to understand people, um, the need to walk in the shoes of the consumer and have foresight and involvement and commitment in their lives, as one client here, here says. It means that uh, a lot of clients right now are thinking more deeply about uh, more longitudinal studies, more ethnographic studies, uh, getting involved themselves much more deeply in the market to try and walk in those shoes, to try and develop that, that sort of empathy, to try and be able to tell the story of the consumer um, back in the, in the boardroom or, or in the C-suite. There was a lady uh, in a senior position at a very large uh, packaged goods client who really said it well. And I'm going to read this if, you, if you'll excuse me because I think she uh, encapsulates what people are meaning about empathy. I think it's easy for me to care for consumers because I don't look at a consumer and say they are my secret to higher penetration. I don't walk into someone's home and shake their hand and say, with this consumer I will have higher share numbers. I don't look at a consumer and see an Excel spreadsheet with yellow, green, and red. I don't look at people and see metrics. I look at people and see people. I think that is uh, interesting from a number of points of view, because she started that quote out by saying, I think it's easy for me to care for consumers. And this lady, as we talked with her, it was quite clear she did care for consumers. She was interested in their lives. She was empathetic with their lives. And she wants to be able to use that empathy to be able to provide insights. It's interesting how words gain traction in marketing and in equally in research. We're seeing empathy now cropping up everywhere. Just last month here in the US, there was a conference a Customer Experience Leaders Summit, and it was all about empathy. Return on relationships factoring empathy into the stakeholder equation. Every single paper in that conference was about leveraging emotion and empathy. Who would have thunk that there would have been 
a conference devoted entirely to that. There are even books that we can now buy on empathetic marketing and using empathy in the boardroom and using empathy in leadership and so on and so on. So underneath, as we said, this conversation surrounding big data, there is the conversation surrounding empathy. And it really is the yin to the yang. If we look at empathy as a rich tool, it's also clear to many people that that puts even more emphasis on the necessity of us building our synthesis skills and our synthesis processes. And this, again, is from a uh, very senior executive at a large research company. And this is what he's talking about when he's talking about synthesis. We have a lot of great analysts, but they can't tell me what to do differently. They can't tell our clients what to do differently. Hence, you need to find the right person or a group of people that bring together both hard skills, the ability to analyze, as well as soft skills, the ability to synthesize and say, my experience tells me we need to be doing this in this situation. The ability to analyze and the ability to synthesize are two different skills. To have both in one individual is hard, but those that you do find, make sure you keep them. And this is, to me, again, interesting because I think in our work as consultants, we do find that the difference between analysis and synthesis is not one that is, is very well understood. And yet, it is arguable, and people in our studies do argue this, that the skills inherent in synthesis will become as important as those in analysis, if not more so. So this leads to a question. What sort of talent will we need, given both uh, the, the, the trundling train of big data, but also uh, this emphasis uh, on empathy? What are the talents we're going to need to be effective in the C-suites and in the boardrooms of the future? Many would argue that we're going to need consultants, management consultants. And indeed, if you look back over the last 12 to 18 months, at least a dozen of the Fortune 500 uh, companies have installed a management consultant from one of the big three in as their head of insights. So maybe the consultant is necessary to be able to take the story and embed it in the, in the C-suite and get the ear of the CMO and the ear of the, the, the CEO. Or will we need what my colleague Ian Lewis calls polymaths? And for anybody not recognizing this picture, it's not my colleague Ian Lewis, it's Leonardo da Vinci. But Leonardo da Vinci was a great polymath, an expert in many things. And it's arguable that we're going to need polymaths, people expert in many things, to be able to make sense of uh, all the different insight sources and streams and data streams, and to be able to connect the dots. These will be the great synthesis of the future. Or maybe we need specialists. There are so many different ways today of gaining insights, so many different new technologies, so many methodologies, um, all the way from digital qualitative through to uh, massive data mining. No one person can do all of those. So maybe we're going to need specialists in all of these disciplines to be able to feed the polymaths who could feed the consultants. Perhaps this is the era of the data geek. This is the era of the data master lord, uh, the people who control the data within the organization, the people who are data analysts, and that's what they were trained in. McKinsey has said that in North America alone, there will be a shortage of 190,000 data analysts by the year 2020, which means that anybody wants to make a good salary, that's a good, good place to go and, and, uh, and have your career. 
Maybe we're going to be needing these people more than anything. Or maybe we need storytellers. All of this data, all of these insights, all of these uh, stories that are building within companies, maybe we need people who are able to tell these stories effectively. There's a very famous, maybe slightly mythical um, uh, story about how the board of Unilever was persuaded to launch Dove Soap despite having pro procrastinated uh, on masses of data. Uh, they were persuaded by the skill of storytelling which involved film of their wives and loved ones using the soap. Maybe those are the types of people we need in uh, our research ca uh, capabilities in the future. Or maybe, maybe we need all of these. We need the data geeks to be able to make sense of and corral and structure the data and provide frameworks to them. We need the specialists to be able to uh, bring us uh, capabilities for producing insights that were not there before. We need the polymaths who have the ability to connect it all together. We need the storytellers to be able to fashion and tell the story. And we need the consultants to convince the top brass of the actions that are needed. If so, this is an interesting industry in which to work in the next uh, five to ten years as the influence of big data and yet the importance of what we have always been so good at, understanding the customer, understanding the consumer, and bringing that understanding empathetically into the boardroom as those things merge and become as one. This is the industry in which we're going to live. Thank you very much, and I will be very pleased to take any questions that you may have, uh, and thank you for your patience.